it's alive. What has this science fiction classic done for the image of science? It's alive! Gosh, talk about a mad scientist archetype. You know, this guy is working in his secret lair, doing horrible, unethical <laughs> things. Indeed, Frankenstein's become the archetypal story invoked whenever scientists are seen to be meddling with nature. So, we thought we'd ask the question, what's science fiction ever done for us? When it comes to the science, how accurate is it? And in terms of image, is sci-fi ultimately friend or foe of science? Let's start with one of the classics, Star Trek. To boldly go where no man has gone before. The stories are set centuries in advance, so there's plenty of room for speculation. A warp drive, for example, that manages faster than light travel, can't yet be ruled out by the laws of physics. But is a matter transporter possible? In all the Star Trek stories, it reads a person atom by atom, then rebuilds them somewhere else. We ask physicist and writer Professor Lawrence Krauss. Alas, unfortunately, the transporter, I would argue, is impossible. It's because of quantum mechanics that I don't think you'll be able to transport people now or ever, because, in fact, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that I can't explore you down to the atomic level and make an exact reproduction of you. German physicist Werner Heisenberg showed there's a fuzziness at the atomic level, making it difficult to predict the behaviour of particles. Now, the Star Trek makers, like Michael Okuda, knew this was a problem. So on the show, if you watch it, there's Heisenberg compensators. And when Michael Okuda was asked, you know, how do they work? He said, very well, thank you. <laughs> Some movies go to great trouble to get the science right. I caught up with astrophysicist Katie Mack to hear about one of her favourites. The Martian, starring Matt Damon. Seeing the Martian landscape was amazing and all of the rockets and everything. I got a huge kick out of it. The technology was quite realistic. The creators must have spent some time studying NASA. And even Mars's moons were the right wonky shape. The Martian is all about problem solving. You're in this difficult situation, you have to figure out how to survive. And I thought that was done pretty well. I found the scenery particularly realistic. The landscapes were just as you'd imagine them from NASA's pictures. Really made me feel like I was there. And they do have dust devils on Mars. They do, That's yeah. That's good to see. Yeah, yeah. I got really excited when I saw I was taking notes in the cinema when oh, I really? saw this. Yeah, because yeah, I was going to write something <laughs> about it, and I wrote down, dust devils! Martian dust devils can be 50 times wider than ours and 10 times higher. But not all was realistic. Yeah, so that dust storm, to me, way too strong. There wouldn't be things flying through the air like that. It wouldn't be blowing things over. That's because on Mars, the winds may be 100 kilometres an hour, but the atmosphere's thin. The pressure is less than 1% of Earth's, so the winds can't pack much punch. But I guess they needed something to start the movie dramatically. My first experience of a movie that was so scientifically accurate, even the experts in the field were impressed, was when I was doing a story on flu pandemics. And this was the movie Contagion. A flu pandemic sweeps the world, kills hundreds of millions of us. Civilization falls apart. It's a Hollywood doomsday scenario. What would a scientist make of it? It's very realistic, yet genuinely scientifically sound. Respiratory spread viruses are the worst nightmare. In some ways, it's a, it's a documentary. It's actually documenting, guys, this is round the corner. Yeah, yeah, I love that film. That's one of the movies that I think does the best job of depicting how scientists actually are. They just really were interested in the problem. They were passionate about their work. And the way that they talked and the way that they acted just seemed very realistic to me. And so I, I love seeing that on screen because it's so rare. The movie Interstellar took the science to an extreme by having this man as one of the executive producers. Black hole expert, indeed physics guru, Professor Kip Thorne. Kip even wrote a book explaining the physics of the movie. Central to Interstellar is a supermassive black hole. These beasts can slow time. It's because of their immense gravity. Indeed, gravity slows time even when it's only slightly stronger, like it is at sea level on Earth, compared to high up. 
on the surface of the Earth, time flows more slowly than at high altitude by one second in a century, one second out of 100 years. That's a tiny, tiny slowing of time, but that means if you live on the surface of the Earth, you move to the future faster, and that has been tested experimentally. A black hole's extreme gravity amplifies the effect unimaginably. And so if you get very close to a black hole, uh, you could linger there for an hour and you could go as far into the future as you might want if, if you can manage to get down there that close to the black hole and then get back out. Ah, look at yeah, that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. great. The black hole graphics were particularly stunning. The imagery of the black hole was based on real equations and they got some papers out of that, so that was really neat. So what you see is what a camera actually would see if it were up near the black hole or the wormhole. It's marvelous. It's the first time it's ever been attempted in a Hollywood movie. Although Katie's not entirely happy with Guru Kip's film. There was some aspects of it that I wasn't... <laughs> I didn't oh, like come so on, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> no um, offense to Kip, of course. Sure. You know, I mean, as an astrophysicist, you know, I, I actually study what's, what's out there. And there are things in that film that we really wouldn't expect to find. There was a planet very close to a black hole without giving too much away. I think that's very unlikely. The problem is black holes are known for eating everything that comes their way, including planets. But maybe that's being pedantic. After all, Kip's primary goal was inspiration. And that's an important point. It seems good science fiction does inspire scientists. Take the movie, Gravity. I mean, I don't really have a desire to go into space and be an astronaut, <laughs> but I could sort of see the appeal of it yeah. from the movie. It was beautiful. I mean, I saw it in IMAX 3D twice, just because it was such a beautiful, immersive experience. You know, it looked like being really in space. And I've heard interviews of astronauts who said that, yeah, that's what it looked like on the space station. That's what it looks like on a spacewalk. It did really spark that in me, that desire to go out there and explore. <laughs> But could science fiction sometimes be bad for science? Because it falsely raises public expectations. As a kid, I was inspired by visions of the future like this. I still don't have my flying car yet. Actually, inventors have been working on them, probably because they were inspired too. But flying cars do seem a little impractical. And what happened to those jetpacks science fiction promised in the 60s? You know, I was reading up on jetpacks a few weeks ago, and, and you know, most of them are horribly dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a really bad idea to strap a jet to your back and fly through the air. When I was a kid, a guy from NASA, I think, came out with a jetpack and yeah. gave a demonstration at the yeah. showgrounds, but actually, I think he crashed. Yeah, they're really impractical. <laughs> also, science fiction can give a false sense of how science progresses. And one of the things that always amazes me, say, on Star Trek, is they're having a big problem and they get the engineers together and they solve the problem within an hour, whereas in the real world, as a scientist, it can take decades and baby steps to make any major progress. But perhaps one of the key benefits of sci-fi is it helps make the future seem more possible. Like with The Martian, you know, you see this landscape, it's depicted as a place you can go, an achievable goal. And so I think a lot of times, People see these kinds of depictions in science fiction and that makes it seem more achievable and it makes it seem like more of a goal that they can work toward. And for Mars, that seems to be working. Inspired scientists and lay people alike are already planning to journey there.